So welcome to this uh, session on the types of artifacts uh, that we can find when recording EEG and how to handle them. And uh, well, uh, we will make this session a little bit more interactive. So we have prepared, well, my colleague, my colleague Sergio has prepared a Kahoot. So uh, we would like you to join and try to answer some of the questions we will be making to you. Please uh, don't use funny names. We have uh, a prize for the winner and uh, second and third places also will get something. So if your name involves, uh, I don't want to say anything disgusting, but uh, just use your names, please. Uh, I don't know if the last uh, the, the the last person in the quiz will get an intracranial EEG or not. We're deciding on that. <clears throat> Depends on, on the amount of volunteers for the hand-on. But uh, okay, so thank you, Sarah. Okay, we'll wait for uh, a bit, letting everybody to sign in. <coughs> yes, if, if somebody online is the winner, we'll try to send it, uh, to send the prize. Okay, also, uh, when we were doing tests on this Kahoot, uh, if you play on your mobile phone uh, and uh, it's, if somehow your screen goes off, then it will, it will take some time to get online again. And so try not to try to avoid the the, the, the slipping of the, of the screen. Guillermo, tío. Guillermito PC. I know who you are. Where are you? Okay, so 55, 56. Ah. Okay, so. Now we're going down, 57, 56. Okay. So should we start? Let's go then. So welcome to the EEG quiz. No question here? Can you tell me how fast brain information travels? It's very fast, and it does not depend on the amount of coffee you've taken. But <clears throat> so, 
brain information travels at around a little bit more than 400 kilometers per hour. Uh, it's quite fast if you think about it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a natural uh, transmission of electrical impulses in, in neurons. No? It's, uh, they're designed to do that. Uh, electrical impulses travel uh, along the axons at uh, pretty impressive velocity. So, and when something happens to this transmission, then you get something wrong. No? There are a lot of things that can go wrong, but we'll get into that later. So, ready for the next? How much water do we have in the brain? Come on. Don't ask to chat GPT. He doesn't have a brain. <clears throat> oh. Okay. It's a lot. Around three quarters of the brain is water. And one of the reasons why you have to keep hydrated is not, not to turn it into, uh, I don't know. So a dehydration is it will affect you and will affect your brain as well. Next, how much energy our brains produce? If you saw Matrix, you know that. Matrix. If you are sleeping, you produce less energy, but... Right. <clears throat> it's 23 watts. <clears throat> Enough to power some lights uh, in this room, I suppose. And the brain does that by consuming uh, glucose, of course. But it's pretty impressive, no? I mean, <clears throat> you can, maybe you can cook something with that, or cook yourself. Uh, next. We also know that the brain is the fattest uh, organ in the body. How much of the dry weight of the brain is fat? Three, two, one it's a lot so don't try to get your body fat person to zero because it's very bad 60 <laughs> percent of the brain is is fat uh, about 25% of the total cholesterol is uh, found in the brain. And it has, uh, well, it plays a, a role in, in many of the brain's functions. So uh, that was question four. Let's go for five. Double points. How many thoughts per minute can a brain produce? Don't try to count them. Bad thoughts also count.
Only 50, sorry. <laughs> It's a lot of thoughts per day. You cannot tell your wife I'm thinking about nothing. It's not true. But you can tell I'm busy. We are always busy. So <clears throat> next. This is interesting. How many neurons does a piece of brain tissue as a grain of sand have? Sometimes we, we are not aware of the scale of neurons. That's a lot. 100,000. When you think of the resolution of uh, an MRI in one cubic millimeter, you have a lot of neurons in there. How can you tell that all of them are doing the same thing? It's something that we, we will discuss in the next days, but it's a lot. We have uh, around 86 billion neurons in the brain. So it's, as it says here, it's uh, like having a galaxy inside your brain. It's a lot. Okay, double again. How much do we use our brain? No, it, it doesn't depend on it. It doesn't depend on the person. You can use it right or wrong, but it doesn't depend on the person. <laughs> So, unless you're some kind of zombie, you're using 100% of your brain. It's not true that we use only 10% or uh, somebody selling these uh, self-help books will tell you, but we use around 10%, a little bit more than 10% of it when we are sleeping. But other than that, uh, we use the whole brain. And what percentage of the body's total energy and oxygen does the brain use? Five seconds. around 20% of the total amount. So, Diana is getting it. So, uh, well, we all know that our brain now needs a constant supply of oxygen. And uh, uh, well, the harder you think, the more oxygen and fuel you will consume. So don't go to the gym, just think. Next. <clears throat> how many or oh, how, how long are the blood vessels in the brain to do all this work? It's a lot. I was amazed when I saw the answer. It's four times around the world. It's a lot. Next, how much an average brain weight? I mean, it depends on the size of your head, but 
in average. A bit more than a kilogram. So I have to read it. Men tend to have larger brains than women. Does that not imply that intelligence is larger? And uh, well, as a, as a fun fact, Einstein's brain was 10% smaller than average. So he was using it a lot efficiently, more efficiently than the rest. How many impulses does a neuron transmit per second? That's a lot, up to 1,000. We can generate a lot of uh, electrical impulses. So, uh, okay, next. Double points again. Which of these statements is not true? We're getting there, we're getting there. It won't be so easy from now on. So it's not true that all neurons contribute to EEG, basically because, okay, Diana still first place. We are recording uh, with electrodes placed on the scalp, so uh, deeper neurons uh, have less influence on the signal recorded. Even uh, neurons from deep structures don't contribute at all to the signal that we are recording. And not all will be questions. Now you have to pay a bit of attention to answer the, the next. We know that our brains are continuously working and that uh, neurons uh, communicate between them. Uh, small populations of neurons can synchronize to the organizing networks. We'll talk about a lot about this in the next few days. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, for that activity to be recorded well, on the scalp, I mean, the, the electric uh, signal has to cross your skull, your fatty tissues, the skin, and then be recorded. You need a lot of synchronized neurons to get some signal uh, there. So, uh, well, this is how the signals look like. Well, if you can see uh, the right uh, pictures. There's a, a decomposition in the four typical bands from high to low frequency from top to the bottom namely beta, alpha, theta, and delta, and delta, sorry. And you can see a typical spectrum on the bottom. So this is more or less what, what uh, the AG looks like. And uh, we usually record, uh, as I said, placing electrodes on the scalp. Uh, the number of electrodes depends on the budget. <laughs> uh, that's true. <coughs> Typically, we use 64 electrodes because from 60, below 64, there are some things that are quite difficult to do, like uh, inverse modeling or some things like that. And we also need uh, a reference, uh, usually 
recordings are, are differential recordings, so we, you need this reference and one ground electrode for the patient or the, the individual. Uh, increasing the density of electrodes will allow you to make more detailed measurements and perform uh, uh, different uh, estimations. More than 128, uh, it becomes nearly impossible to place them uh, on your head, and uh, there is a lot of correlation between them, so the information between two neighboring electrodes is the same. It doesn't make sense to add <coughs> more electrodes to that. But as I said, uh, the more electrodes you have, the more information you can use to do the compositions or inverse modeling. But uh, what you'll see in the hands-on training is not fast. It's not easy to place 64 electrodes uh, on the scalp. Imagine 128. It takes, it takes some time. OK, next. Which kind of electrodes do we use? Well, the, the most important thing for an electrode is that the contact uh, with the skin is, is good. So this means that the, the impedance has to be as low as possible so that we get the best recording, uh, the best possible recording. So usually uh, we use wet electrodes, which are more difficult to place because you have to make sure that they are uh, well that the gel is correctly placed and so on and uh, yeah well with the increasing number of electrodes this uh, takes more time there are other alternatives like dry electrodes that uh, make contact directly with the skin but I mean, if you have hair and well it's the, the quality of the signal that you get is not the best in these cases. There are also active electrodes which make up for this lack of contact, but usually wet electrodes still give the, the best uh, the best signal that we can record. Next. Okay, and what about the equipment, no? the amplifier? Once we, we stick the electrodes on the scalp, we connect this uh, to the amplifier, which are the requirements that, that we need to record an EEG. So we need a sampling rate. Uh, if you consider that the bandwidth is around 80 hertz, so uh, we need to double this for the sampling rate. So anything larger than 160 hertz would be OK. Uh, there are some applications that uh, require more uh, higher sampling rate, but 256 is quite common. <coughs> and the resolution, it also depends on the, well, on the hardware that you have, but 10, 12, 16 bits is, is more or less usual. Because uh, we are recording a signal that is a few microvolts, so it's, you need uh, you need good resolution to, to record that. And then uh, regarding power supply or, or mobility of the equipment, it also depends on the budget. Uh, battery powered uh, amplifiers are nice because you can isolate your patient or your subject from the, from the electrical network. So uh, you don't get uh, as much as interference and you don't have to and probably if it has a battery you can move it because it's smaller and you can do strange things that you cannot do with a big equipment that is on a table and connected to the to the outlet no but well, we've seen everything so it depends a lot on your application on what you are trying to do And now we're getting, do you remember the topic of the session was artifacts and how to handle them? So once you get all the electrodes, you have configured the amplifier and your subject is ready, you hit the record button and you don't get an EEG. You get a lot of noise and strange things like this uh, that we see here. You can get undesirable contributions to your signal that come from outside the body. Uh, I mean, 
movements, electrodes, uh, electrical interference, or even from inside the body. Like you are recording EEG, but you can get ECG, you can get um, muscle interference, everything that it is there can contribute to the signal that you are recording. So we'll go and, and have a look at them. Next question will be about this uh, this plot. You can see some signals here and some strange thing happening in them. Have a look at them and then we'll ask the question. Which is the artifact that you can see in this recording? Good. It's a electrode pop, like when you touch them, or they move for for some reason. Uh, it's a failure in the contact or a change in the in the contact with the, the of the electrode with the skin. There's a change in impedance because of that, and uh, you get this transient that uh, well, it's not really EEG. It's something else. Well, you can see another example here. This is typical when you have a sensor that is not working and you go and you touch it repeatedly to see if it's it's the cable or it's the electrode or or something else. So next, uh, we have another kind of artifact here. Uh, well, have a look. And which kind? Is it now? It's very typical when you tell the person not something, and then yeah, yeah, don't breathe, no. These, these were eye blinks, and it's typical. Don't blink, and then you get seven of them. Oh, you know the eye has a is <clears throat> is modeled as a well can be modeled as a dipole, magnetic or electric dipole, and uh, when it moves, this charge affects the recording, especially in the frontal channels. But it's something that propagates to the back, so you can see in the right figure, uh, how the channels from top to the bottom are from from to the back, and how this activity, these two eye blinks, are propagating. And this is something that, uh, well, we can remove later. It's something that can be more or less removed. But uh, you, you cannot avoid having this, unless you drag the subject or, I don't know, everybody blinks. And uh, if you're performing uh, some kind of, uh, of experiment that involves looking and having some, uh, some kind of uh, stimulus, it, it's impossible to, to avoid this. And with other kinds of stimulation, as we will see, it's, uh, it also happens. So, uh, well, blinking is typical. It's also used to see if that everything is working. You connect the, the EHA cap and tell the, the person blink and if you see the propagation everything is is going okay so here you can see a, a representation of how uh, an eye blink is affecting now the the lower uh, the lower traces are uh, correspond to the front and if, as you go up, uh, you go back uh, on the scalp, so 
you can see that the amplitude is is reduced as you uh, as you go to the back of the and then uh, we don't we will not only have the blinks but we have the artifacts produced when the eye moves the eye can move in every direction it can move up and down or uh, left left or left to right right to left and you get different traces in the EEG because of that it's a chart that, that is moving and you get uh, artifacts as well and these are also used to to see that the recording is is at least the setup is correct this is something that you know that will happen so you force it uh, to see that everything is working okay okay another question you can see several artifacts here but uh, just focus on on the red square red rectangle and let's see which kind of artifact is that This is uh, something that has to do with your heart. It's a, in this case, is an electrical artifact coming from the the ECG. But depending on the placement of the electrodes, uh, can be also related to to the pulse, to, to the volume of, of blood. Uh, if you place an electrode on top of an artery, it will move, and you will get also this this uh, heart rhythm into your signals but uh well it's it's something you cannot avoid as well uh, it depends a lot uh also on the 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 position sometimes in which the subject is placed but you cannot tell a person stop your heart for a minute and then we'll record the you know it's it's there so next more artifacts especially the one in the middle so what kind of artifact is that Gemma what kind of artifact is that <laughs> Now she's using 120% of her brain. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's an external artifact induced by stimulation, in this case, using a TMS machine that induces a, a very, very high peak uh, and you can also see that, uh, well, because of the stimulation, you get also uh, uh, muscle artifacts and other things. But it's a very large artifact compared to the to the electrical activity of the brain. So it is quite difficult to remove it. So Gemma will tell you more about that. Okay, more. Uh, we have uh, well some strange traces in there in the middle. Any idea what what does what does what can it be? Sorry. I have to say, this is something I did not know before Sergio prepared the cow. I've never seen it.
it's a ventilator artifact and it has a an interesting way of getting into your signals because it, it, it's because of humidity it is the amount of water that gets into the tubing that gets charged electrically and then it it oscillates and well it gets in there and it seems like uh it's right in the in the bands of eeg so something you, you you, you can get rid of it by cleaning the the tubing of the ventilator but it's there so uh, our our respiration has a, an amount of uh, water so you cannot avoid it anyway it will appear sooner or later okay next This is is EMG coming from the from the jaw, for example. If you are recording using a protocol that involves the subject to to reply or uh, do something, or even if you have the, your cap attached with a strap, and people, I mean, you can uh, I don't know, you're chewing something or you you get this this emg contamination into the eg or i mean you can sneeze that's something that will get there and it's slightly higher frequency than the eg but it, it gets there as well so uh, well you have to avoid them as much as possible but uh, i don't know if you get saliva in your mouth and you have to 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 swallow it's impossible so you get you have to repeat or something or or discard or filter whatever so a lot of article artifacts we've seen we still have some more that is a huge artifact it's it's movement artifact so I've seen some systems that have active electrodes that uh, are not affected by this kind of movement, but uh, it's something that not all amplifiers have. And also imagine that you have a protocol and your subject is sitting there for 30 minutes. Uh, it will move, he, will, he or she will move. It's impossible to stay put for, for a lot of time. Uh, or, I mean, it's the cables will move, somebody will enter the room without a warning, or, uh, I mean, you just uh, adjust your, your, your seat. It's something that will get there as well. It's usually a low-frequency artifact, but uh, well, it depends also on the contacts and so on. So... I expect my students to get this right <laughs> because it's the first thing I tell them to filter. So, which kind of artifact is this?
No pressure. I was going to say, don't sweat it, but... Because it, it's a sweet, sweating artifact. If your skin gets uh, damp, uh, you know, sweat is also conductive, so the impedance is changing very slowly, that's why it's so low frequency, but... Uh, this change in, in contact and in impedance uh, will affect the recording as well. This is something that usually it's outside the, the interesting frequency range of the signal, so you can filter it away very easily. That's why we explain it in class. But, uh, well, it's there as well. And it can, if you don't take this into account, you get very strange uh, behavior there. In the end, your your traces, your your EG gets out of the screen. So, uh, I'm not uh, reading this to reduce try cooling the patient by lowering the room temperature. Anybody from the UPC here? Okay. Sometimes this is not possible as well. I mean, I th think of a hospital with a room control temperature. You know, it is probably not the best place to make a recording, but you uh, you will have this. Okay, we're getting there. Five, six more questions. We have another artifact in there, under the arrows. Time's up. It's respiration, it's low frequency. So, Saul and Rick are very close. This is uh, something that is more common in sleep recordings. Uh, Probably because uh, you place the electrodes and then the person gets uh, in horizontal position in it's touching or moving or this rhythmic respiration uh, affects also the contact. It's not so usual when you do a, something sitting and, and awake, but it can also affect your recordings. Uh, well, it's a slow frequency, it's uh, usually filtered out as well. Next. This, this is the last one. And uh, my students should also get this right. This is a very typical artifact. It is the classical power line uh, interference. So uh, sometimes we've uh, gone on a quest to find the right room in a building to do the recording because uh, I don't know where the wiring is placed. I don't know where I will get more or less interference from the power line. 
And it's something that uh, shows as a spike in the frequency spectrum, 50 or 60 hertz. And uh, well, uh, if your electrodes have a high impedance, it will get worse. And uh, well, it's something that is always there. You can filter it out, especially in visualization with a notch filter. But uh, depending on the quality of the filter, you will remove also important information uh, of, the, of your signals. Some uh, some reviewers will not accept uh, filtering some kind of uh, or some kinds of filters uh, on your data. So this is something that if you can avoid as much as possible before uh, acquiring the signal, uh, it will be easier then to, to remove or, or not affecting your recordings at all. <coughs> so, and the winner is... Third position, Anna. <laughs> Congratulations. And second is Saul. And first, Rick. Who is Rick? Ah, Ricardo. <laughs> I told you to use your full name. Sorry. <laughs> and so, Anna, can you? <laughs> Saul. You'll appreciate that because you're not from Barcelona, Saul. Congratulations, Ricardo. So, can you guys? So that that's all for. Eh? Yeah, Saul so uh, chose uh, brain as avatar, so. <laughs> Hi, so Ricardo. So that's all for this session. Uh, you'll learn a bit more if you if you come to the hands-on training about uh, how to remove this from actual recordings. Now you more or less know how to identify them. Removing them is another thing that you'll learn uh, this afternoon. So thank you very much and.